so, you know, today I'm going to talk about the Irish language, but in its place with other ancient languages and the wisdom that they can give one. And all of that comes from who my people were. So, like, I was born in 97, in 1970, okay? Now, the most pivotal thing that ever happened in my life happened in 1916, which is whatever, 56 four years before I was born, I suppose. Um, and that was 1916, the Easter Rising, when we were fighting for Ireland, for our freedom from Britain. My great granduncle, the O'Rahilly, had um, about four years before that, he had set up the first army that was going to fight Britain, the Irish volunteers, him and Professor Owen O'Neill, who's a professor of early Irish history and sort of Celtic, um, Celtic lore in UCD. They set up this volunteer, or the Irish volunteers, which became the Irish Republican Army. Um, and he, so he spent those five years both training to fight for our own independence and also de-anglicizing Ireland. So trying to make sure that we rooted ourselves back in, in our own culture. And like any colonial people, we had lost so much connection with who we were, with what we, with what we represented, with our medicine, with our connection to nature, with our wisdom. And so the O'Rahilly, and he called himself the O'Rahilly because in old Celtic or Gaelic traditions, the head of a tribe or a clan was the, you know, the, T-H-E. So he, he becomes a leader. He studies British warfare to first know how to fight. And then he goes on to the Blasket Islands, which was this island off the West Kerry coastline, which was the last preserver of some of the really ancient folklore, the folklore that went thousands of years back. Um, so he, and he brought my grandmother, who was just like 12 and 13 and 14, out onto the island in 1912, 1913, 1914. And in 1916, the rising happens, the Easter rising happens. Now he has studied warfare, so he knows he's an officer, so he has to lead from the front, and he knows he cannot come back alive. He must die, because he, he's already tried to call off the, the rebellion, the uprising. He realized it's futile, but other leaders want a blood sacrifice. They want, to, they want to be slaughtered. So he says, okay, I helped set this up. I will be slaughtered. But the, before he went, he dressed himself in his fine Irish tweed, again, the same reason that I'm wearing my Irish tweed today. It's sort of a tradition in the family. Um, he dressed himself in his Irish tweed with his silver sword by his side and he goes in his beautiful car, his, his de, de, de Dion Bouton car, very elegant car, in 1916 into the GPO, General Post Office, where we were the center point of the rising. But before he does so, he says goodbye to his wife, who was pregnant at the time, his American heiress wife, Nancy Brown from New York, very wealthy woman, um, he says goodbye to her and his four children, his four sons, who he knows he's never going to see again. And my grandmother is 16 at the time. She's on Easter holidays from the local um, um, Sacred Heart School, Mount Anvil. And so she sees her beloved uncle saying goodbye to his pregnant wife and to the four children, knowing he will never see them again. And for her, that was the most pivotal moment in her life. This man was sacrificing everything for Irish freedom and for the language. And she devoted her family to that. And so the reason the O'Reilly felt that spark was because his great, great, yeah, two greats, great, great granduncle was Aegon O'Reilly, the last great poet of the Bardic school in the 17th and 18th century. These were, these olives, these great filler Bardic uh, poets were entitled to wear cloaks of crimson feathers. Such was their power. They had the same power as a king in the old Ireland, um, the old Irish Brehan law and the old Celtic um, law system. An immensely powerful man who, whose, whose particular power was um, satires, um, who, you know, composing oaths or blessings that could do harm on people. So sharp could they be, so bitter that they could, they could rise a farab on your face. A farab was a wheel or a welt that was risen on the skin by the pure power of the words. This idea, it is a druidic thing, the idea that words have power to manifest in the world. So the O'Rahilly was being inspired by Aegon O'Rahilly, the 17th century poet. And then my grandmother is inspired by the two of them. In 1916, at the age of 16, she sees this sacrifice. She gives up her entire life to fighting for their cause. And she does over three years in and out of prison. She does 33 days on hunger strike at one time fighting like a little terrier. And then I get born in 1970 and she wants to instill the same things in me. So I only ever hear the Irish language until I'm about four, well, despite living in Dublin. And, um, and also she teaches me sort of how to be the fighting spirit and to adore this Irish language. So for example, Monk, and this brings us full circle 
if some of these words um, are endangered or in, in threat of becoming extinct and we're no longer hitting our tongue on the palate in the same way, what does that say about, are we losing a severing a connection with the way our ancestors used to live in relation to the land? Mm -hmm. um, I, I am not despairing. So I don't think, like, it, our inner being can connect to all this wisdom immediately again, or we can turn our being, turn away from it. Like, so there's nothing particularly sacred about the language. What is sacred is a human being on the earth and what we choose, the energies that we choose to, allow, to arise in us. There happen to have been a lot of words in the Irish language and in all old languages that give intriguing insights to old ways of doing. The same insights that our grandparents or definitely our great grandparents had. And we can ask them, we can still ask them for those, what was it like living in a pre-electric world? But let's say just words for light. So in Irish, there are four different words for dawning of the day. And so if that happens, it means you suddenly get very attuned to how light is. And as all of us know, light has an effect on us. That's how we feel elated during the sun. That's how we can feel otherworldly at dusk or at dawn. Because it, and those, all we want, all we want as humans is to get out of that norm, that fear, that controlling, that rational mind, and go to those areas where our heart feels touched. And if that can be done by standing in the rain, or by getting very drunk, or by, you know, being in beautiful light, then it can, then great. And there are beautiful words in Irish that they're still alive, so they can still give us these, these um, tips. Like, obviously it was a world before electricity. So everything, lights were magical. Like there was a word for the light that suddenly sparked when a horse's hoof was walking on, on a stone wall. It was like tinna chris, or tinna shunig, is the, the flashes of flame that suddenly appear over, over peatland. Or tinna yal is the mysterious light that's emitted from putrid fish. So putrid fish would have this degree of, of sort of phosphorescence or oil that will light up. And there's a different word for the luminance seen on the udders of cattle or cows, which is tinahami. And then falkratini is, um, is sort of thunderbolts, but that word for farcha, farcha, farcha is actually the cudgel, the hammer, the, the sort of weapon that the kailach would use to whip in the wind, to whip out the the last of the harvest and bring in winter. So it was a powerful word. But my favorite light words are the words that acknowledge that we could always be in touch with the other world. And that's what I love about ancient languages, that they remind us that we, the other world is always nearby. Like there's a word, lesborn. And lesborn means the dancing colored lights that appear before your eyes at times when you drift a little bit too far towards other dimensions. Lesborn. Or give you, can I give you two more? One is scrimplini, which is the supernatural lights that dance before one's eyes. And then the last is umuscrena, which is sun inspiration. They are these blisters that appear on certain herbs. And if you see this pale blister, you know, if you imbibe that uh, herb, you will be given the power of insight. Mm -hmm. And again, you can say that's magic, but actually it's real, it hints to us that we can go out in nature and pick particular herbs and that'll open the portal. You know, anything will open the portal. The portal wants to open inside of us. So we don't need to chase down a magic, you know, herb or an endangered word. We just need to embrace these hints um, that we are grander and that, we, that a part of ourselves wants to open up to all this. Mm -hmm.